Syria and all these exciting advances. And he was telling me about his first appearance on Question Time. I don't know if any of you saw this, but it's absolutely hilarious, and because I sometimes do it, and he was talking about it, and it is nerve-wracking when you do it. And I said, well, how did it go then? And he said, well, you're not going to believe it. I thought I'd switched my phone off, and I had. And the first question was about Syria. So I say, ah, Syria. And suddenly my phone <laughs> starts telling me the landmass, the population, the capital. That is the danger of new technology. <laughs> I have a question over there. And then Jill another there. Gillian, it's, it's Sarah Thane. It's not so much a question as a comment, really. Tony Stoller and you will know that I had the privilege of being one of the first local radio officers for the IBA. And in my 20s, was I the luckiest girl in the world, you know, to be uh, dealing with all the Midlands commercial radio stations and right, driving around in my car listening to their output, you know, the pop music, the everything was just amazing. Um, and just picking up Nick's, Nick Ferrari's point, yeah. um, I think one of the absolutely crucial things about the advent of independent local radio was the informality of mm. it. And for the first time, lots of local and regional accents being heard, which had never found a place on the BBC. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure that was part of its early stunning success that a lot of people who had felt you know disenfranchised if you like by BBC radio had suddenly got something that they related to so strongly and passionately and I loved being a, a part of that in the early days uh, and I would just like to add one little thing the coverage of Dell Winton's death TV's Mr Nice Guy no, this was, this was the Housewives presenter on Radio Trent in Nottingham and oh. was an yeah, absolute yeah. gem long before anyone knew of his television <laughs> career. Is that right? Mm. Thank you, Sarah. Um, up there? Uh, Peter York, the Media Society. Well, I, I take Nick's point about the directness and realness of commercial radio completely, but at the same time, anyone who's worked in shiny print knows that the influence of the advertisers and their agencies hangs very, very heavy in shiny print. And then it migrated to uh, newspapers as newspapers became poorer and more dependent. How is that division made between advertising and editorial in commercial radio? And this is not a rhetorical question. I really don't know, but people threat about it. I'm going to ask our previous regulator. Gosh. You've regulated uh, in many forms. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a was regulator, but um, it was axiomatic from the start of ITV and then from the start of ILR um, that advertising and programmes should be kept strictly separate. I mean, why, where do we get the phrase natural break? An advertisement may only appear when it is clearly broken from the programmes. That then developed into the concept, as boundaries became more fluid, that listeners should always know when they are being advertised to. And I suspect, but I don't know, I look to those who do know, um, that Ofcom now regulates matters such as product placement with great care. The difficulty which arises is not the influence of advertisers over the programmes, because I, I, I have almost never seen that as a regulator. I've almost never known it as a station manager or a broadcaster. It is the fact that if you are funded by advertising, you have to earn a living. Mm. You don't have to favour a particular advertiser. Indeed, heaven help you if you do, I suspect, looking at Ofcom in the corner. <laughs> I but didn't know they were here. <laughs> <laughs> but <They're> everywhere. <laughs> but what you do have to do is to produce a product which will draw in the audience, which the advertiser wishes to address. That is the way in which our modern society works. And actually the same applies to the BBC. The BBC must also satisfy its ultimate paymasters. You heard David Clementi this morning talk about the licence fee payer. That always makes me twitch slightly. It's when a local councillor talks about, you used to talk about the rate payer and you guess something tendentious was coming out. But the reality is, unless the BBC delivers a product 
which those who speak for the license fee payers regard as acceptable, they have a financial problem. So I don't, I've never seen a direct influence from one to the other, but I know perfectly well that funding and funding sources affect the character mm. of broadcast outlets as they do print outlets, as I suspect they do social media outlets, but that's a bit modern for me. Siobhan, yeah. Siobhan. I think there's I just got a point to make on, on sort of throwing that back to the audience as well, is what, what does the audience find acceptable too is a really key part, obviously, of, of what we do. And we've got some very interesting research about people, uh, advertisers, trying to use um, the Amazon Echo and how do they regard adverts being inserted into that as opposed to listening to a radio? And they feel very negative about it when, it's, when, when Alexa is responsible for it because it feels like that's sort of intruding into their space. But if it's on the radio, they're quite used to dealing with it. So it's just, I think it's for us, it's always got to be about what the audience is prepared to accept as well. Nick. Quick line. Peter, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've worked in print, as you're probably aware, and I won't name them, but a couple of newspapers have gone too far and they have sold out. Um, I've worked in radio and it is policed very, very carefully. And I'm not just saying that because Ofcom's in the rule. And I once got it wrong. I didn't get upheld, but I think I got a letter because... Uh, you won't be surprised here. These teeth are not mine, ladies and gentlemen. They were provided by a very good cosmetic dentist. This was many, many years ago. And I mentioned him a few times, and I said what a great job he was doing, right? So that got me a little bit of trouble. But it got me, I think, one of the greatest headlines of my career, which is in the Sunday People, which did the story that DJ, that Nick Ferrari, under the headline, Shock Jock's Dodgy Gob Job. <laughs> and that... That taught me a lesson I remember to the more than anything Ofcom could do. I want to bring it back to Matt because with, with children, yeah. your, uh, your programs are sometimes yeah, sponsored yes. or you have you made an association with. How do you work with that? So we have some we have a few more rules uh, than regular commercial radio, uh, which I think we should. Uh, we don't do advertising for products with high fat, salt, and sugar content, um, and uh, I think coming back to your listeners and our little listeners. <laughs> Uh, should understand what's advertising and what's not advertising. Yeah. Um, also, though, it does... People who have messages that they want to reach uh, children with uh, aren't always advertisers. So we have people who uh, work with us on projects. So we work with the Intellectual Property Office, so the government's Intellectual Property Office wants to teach kids not to illegally download music and to respect copyright. Now, that's quite hard when you're thinking about an eight-year-old. Yeah. Uh, and when, when they came back to the office, I was like, we have to do... They want to do what? <laughs> uh, but what it actually turned into was this series called Nancy and the Meerkats. And Nancy's a French bulldog lead singer of a band, meerkat backing singers. Uh, and the pictures are in my mind. Yeah. 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 I can see it. Uh, and you, <laughs> yes. Uh, and you, you, you follow their, their journey as a band uh, and trying to battle the evil Kitty Purry who's trying to steal all their, their, um, their fans. Um, but actually, we wouldn't have got into that topic without starting with the Intellectual Property Office. It's quite a fun series on, on air. It lives as a little YouTube channel now as well. So it can inspire. Um, and with those things for us, we get a brief. The client doesn't get any control over the editorial. So we come up with all of that, um, and then off it goes. We've got time for one or two more. Uh. Over here first, and then over there. Hello, Charles Runsey, uh, long-time commercial radio listener, listened to, early, listened to a very young Richard Park on Radio Scotland in the 60s. I uh, remember Radio 4 with great memory from the 70s. Started my radio career at Radio Orwell in Ipswich with Sarah Thin uh, as our regulator. I just wanted to um, rain a little on Commercial Radio's parade looking ahead because Sarah mentioned all those happy days of driving around the Midlands, all those big personalities. The trouble is they don't exist anymore because the dark stars of Bauer and Global have snuffed them all out, really. So you now get Toby Anstis on 382 radio stations and um, uh, playing the same songs, but we won't go into that. Um, I just wonder where we're heading down that road, the, the announcement yesterday of Hits Radio. Uh, did Bauer not take over a couple of radio stations in the Northwest, so the Bay FM is gone, others have gone, they've all been rebranded. Um, I just wonder whether we're getting to the state now where in, in 40 years' time there'll be three commercial radio stations and they're not that patchwork quilt. I accept the sociological changes uh, I think partly due to the decline of localness ac across the country. But I just wonder where, I just wonder, Siobhan, what, reg what radio stations you'll be regulating in 
10 years time if you're if you're if you're if you're still there and whether it will just be Toby Anstis on 382 radio stations and of obviously Nick Ferrari on the others. Uh, that would clearly Well, I'll take that yeah. bit, Charles. <laughs> That's, I'm happy with that. <laughs> Doesn't regulate. Luckily, I don't regulate, but I do represent. So, and if it were just Tony Ansys, that would be uh, make my job very easy. I, I, I actually think that uh, the landscape evolves, and it does. It's continually evolved to where it is now. And what you do see is what Gillian was referring to earlier. Not only internet stations, but lots of small DAB stations. So, I think in response to the, what you're just outlining, and it's without a doubt there's been consolidation, up pops because that's what happens, and people can do now with all the new technology available to you, different sorts of ways of, of putting content out there. So it won't be the same as it was, without a doubt. I'm East Coast yeah. FM when I'm in Scotland. So yeah. I, I'm, yeah I'm, you know. I'm going to take one more over okay. here. <clears throat> Just about to brain Sarah Faye. Um, <laughs> This is unusual. This is a question to the chairman of this panel. You don't normally ask questions to the chairman of panels, but... 82. That's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew that. I thought that was a salary, actually, but anyway, go... <laughs> oh, surely. Much more than that. Question, please. Um, we first met years and many years ago, which is why I know your age, um, and you had just won the contract, um, con the ILR contract for Liverpool, and I had been in a contract which had lost, obviously. Um, and uh, since then, we've come across each other um, occasionally. You went on to a very distinguished career in print. I actually went on at one point to, to be on the board of the Independent Broadcasting Authority. And I spent ages there, and as Sarah will know and remember, to get an ILR contract then, you had to write a huge Bible, um, answering many questions and promising all sorts of things that you would do. Yeah. And this took up a great deal of my life then, um, th uh, though it didn't go on forever. But Gillian, you're almost best place to judge. How do you think it all turned out with <laughs> ILR? <laughs> well, uh, it turned out differently. We did, we so promised a lot of things, and we did a lot of things. We did do uh, drama in a form. We gave Alan Bleasdale his first professional uh, steady money, writing and presenting a fictional disc jockey show. <laughs> we nicked it from Radio Merseyside. <laughs> but, um, but we did that. We did, we did do news, we did do sport, but those were different days. Those were days when it was, as Tony would say, very mandated. You had to promise to do this, you had to promise to do that in order to get the franchise. The things are different now. I think in a way, there is always room for experiment in radio. There still is, even with, even with, um, with the big companies owning most of them. I mean, Bauer owns Radio City now in Liverpool. And I always look when the radio ratings come out, because when we had Radio City, uh, it took, and, and you know, for the decade after, uh, I left. Um, the ratings were always Radio City top and Radio Merseyside slightly behind. Both of them very high. Now Radio Merseyside is way ahead because they are still offering a more varied uh, output. It isn't just the same old disc jockey saying the same old things. It's not just the same degree of outrage. But I do think, and I'll come back for a comment from all of you on this as we close, I do think that there is room in radio to do different things because the budget isn't enormous. Uh, you can, if you're popular, like some people around this table, you can say, I'd like to do this, I'd like to try that. Um, is it possible to do that? Siobhan? Well, I would say, because speaking to an advertising audience is what we say all the time, that we think the potential in radio is actually huge because it's not where all the awards are. So therefore, you can have a bit of a free reign. And because you can create the theatre of the mind, you could create absolutely amazing radio adverts, but I'm still waiting to hear most of them, I must say. <laughs> Tony, you, you, I mean, you listen all the time, I know, and to loads of stuff. I think the creative energy in, in radio and I think in non-BBC radio for the points that Nick was making about the extra freedom is potentially enormous. But I'm not sure there is enough space given for that energy. And part of the problem is that 
successive governments invariably legislate for the 10 years that went before <laughs> rather than the 10 years that are to come. So we at the moment are, are, are living in a world of the, uh, the, the wiping away of local obligations because that is what now is, 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 is wished for by legislation at a time when localness is reasserting itself. Mm. And I have the concern that governments, regulators, all of us, need to let that creative energy emerge. I think it's there. Heard it, some of it from Matt, heard some of it from Nick. It's obviously there. It's got to find a way through. It's, it's, it's Leonard Cohen, isn't it? Um, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. We need to let the light in. I think there's an interesting thing about in, in, in the first part of my career, I bid for FM licenses, and you pretty much swapped promises for scare spectrum. So you promised things you didn't probably want to do, but you knew you had to do it to win the license. Whereas we're totally the other direction now where anyone can launch a radio station. You know, for digital radio, you just need to, to, to buy some space, and it's, it's not hugely expensive to do. Um, so actually, the stations people are putting together, uh, haven't got, they're not underpinned by promises. They're about what people want to do. And you see that with new local digital radio stations popping up, stations like Fun Kids, uh, religious stations, ethnic stations. Um, and actually, I think there's a purity in that. Uh, and they're, when I go and speak to those people similar to us, they're very passionate about that because they're not pretending. Mm. Uh, they want to do that thing and do it well. Mm. Nick? You asked how has it got on. I'm a relative new arrival into radio compared to some of the people here. I never expected to get into radio, and I tell you quite candidly, it's the second best job I have ever had, the best job being father to my two sons. I feel myself so fortunate to have come into your industry. I can't still really feel it's part of my industry. And I finish by just quoting one figure that unfortunately Siobhan didn't quote when she talked about trust. And Charles, this plays to, I hear what you say about the radio station, but just remember that trust figure that Siobhan shared with us. If it comes to trust in radio, 77%. In TV, 74%. What Siobhan didn't share with you, if you take it to the breakfast arena where I work, the difference is more like about 15 percentage points, radio over television. So, ladies, shut your ears, but shove that up your ass, Piers Morgan. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all very much That's for being such finished. a good audience, and thank you, brilliant panel. Well done, well done, you. Well done, you. This yes. Could run and run. yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Gillian, for, uh, and the panel members, for it was a really excellent and stimulating final session. It's not always easy to end the conference. It could not have ended better than that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a couple of quick, quick announcements. Um, a reminder to fill in the uh, feedback form, which is in, in your package. Feedback not just about this conference, but also about your broader interaction with the VLV, whether or not you're a member. And also, uh, to draw your attention to our next two upcoming events, and on the 18th of June of this, uh, in, what's that, six weeks' time, something like that? Uh, on the 18th of June, we've got a session with the Secretary of State, Matt Hancock, in the House of Commons, uh, a Q&A for members with Matt Hancock. You remember we had one of these with John Whittingdale, oh, and I'm glad to say that uh, Matt Hancock is doing that as well. And then, of course, the next... Uh, conference will be our autumn conference which is on the 27th of November 2018. Just a couple of quick thank yous. Thank you to everybody, all my colleagues in the VLV who have helped put this conference together, especially Sophie Chalk who's been the principal organiser. Thank you so much uh, Sophie and I thank you also to, to Mary, Mary Dixon who was the, the principal organiser of the I think very successful award ceremony. And, but above all, thank you all for, for coming. And a reminder to members, after a quick cup of tea and coffee, we come back from Members Forum in about a quarter of an hour. So thank you very much, everybody. You were marvellous. You were all marvellous. Good bookings. Good bookings, Excellent. Shall we get the band back together?